So I'm Tammy Lee Meyer, and I'm pleased to spend a bit of time with you guys, but I'd love to do a check-in about what it is that we'd like to get out of our session today. Um, I'll do a little bit of a piece around my intentions and what I'd like to hope to get out of this, just so that you can kind of get that piece before I invite you to join in. Uh, I'm inspired by both of you. Um, John, I love the uh, Othello. I'd really like to know more about its functionality. I appreciated the piece that you sent ahead of time uh, that, that really shows what it is. But I'd love to have a conversation that helps me to understand and therefore other people to understand what it is that Othello is and can do. And specifically, um, I'm really curious in terms of how it can help us with the Global Challenges Collaboration and to see how we can utilize it as a cohort of collaborators to be able to design some of the protocols, processes, and ways of knowing and being that can help us to transition to better systems, which is the intent of the proposal that we're putting in. Uh, so, okay. yeah, Sam, maybe, maybe I can invite you to jump in and, and share your intentions and your hopes. Sure. Hey, John, uh, thanks for sharing the video of the uh, demo, because I, I watch it, and it came up with, you know, some areas where I have yet to understand, so I think I'll probably touch on some of those. But my interest is uh, very similar to uh, Tammy's, but uh, particularly around the edges of the product. You know, in other words, I saw that it very effectively uh, supported some group design selections among 27,000 options or whatever it was. Mm -hmm. But I, uh, I'm curious whether the creation of those options is something that is also supported by the tool or whether that modeling of the options and which of the di dimensions have to be actually uh, considered by the population is in some sense uh, predetermined by some sort of modeling that does, uh, that's done by some group before the thing scales. I'm, I'm curious about that particular uh, aspect of it. Yeah. So in other words, applications of it above and beyond, let's say, physical design of objects or spaces. I'm really curious, you know, what the different domains are that okay. it applies to, okay? So that's sure. one area. Yeah. And another area is, can the dimensions of evaluation, you know, rather than lead quality, rather than energy usage, blah, 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 can those dimensions be, let's say, uh, bubbled up from the population itself through the uh, consideration process. I'm, I'm wondering about those kind of things as well. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, clearly, you know, the more tactical interest is can we use it in this GCC team activity, which is trying to scale to first 100, then 1,000, then 3,000, and 30,000, you know. So it's that kind of scale we're kind of looking for. And then, of course, thirdly, I love looking at new models of, you know, people thinking about how people – come together, align, and then decide to do something, you know, okay? Mm -hmm. And that touches on a number of my core ideas behind what I'm calling collaborology. Uh, so I'm really curious to see, you know, what's really driving you and Othello and what its future directions are. All right. So do you want me to speak to those in order? <laughs> um, maybe you can just dive into your intentions just to start, and then we'll just flow into your answers if that works, because I'd love to hear your intentions for our session today, too. Well, I'm just here to respond. You know, I didn't really have very strong intentions coming out. I'm here to, you know, kind of help you and provide information and explain Othello. So, you know, I'm at your service for the next the while. is to have your brain picked then, right? <laughs> yeah, there it is. Exactly. <laughs> okay, okay, thanks, John. So, I guess first meta question. Yeah. Is Othello something that can actually support a, a conversation like this and how it actually evolves? Um, in real time? No. Mm -hmm. It's more of a structured decision-making process. So as you noted, there's a configuration stage um, that usually precedes uh, an engagement. Um, mm -hmm. It can be used for an ideation, you know, to bubble up options. But there is a step of, kind of configuring it and getting things set up. Mm -hmm. So um, in that respect, it's kind of a formal decision-making process is rather than a, an informal one. Mm -hmm. So in other words, the key components of that preparation stage, um, that kind of fixes certain 
constraints in the uh, space of options or space of solutions then, right? Yeah, I think the configuration stage you know, predetermines a certain structure. Um, new options can be added as people add suggestions, et cetera, and those can be incorporated. But usually there's some kind of skeleton of the structure that um, provides the framework for people's contributions and, and where things get added in. Okay. So Tammy, just as a note, uh, I'm certainly uh, not as far along with, as John. John's got a system working. But this concept you know, that I've been trying to evolve around this thing I'm calling global sim could potentially then be a, a, a stage that feeds into Othello. So I just want to park that and, as a placeholder for potentially a future conversation. Okay. Great. And I did see in the video that you sent out, John, that, you know, people can make comments at any stage. And at that point, someone who the people that are managing the project itself can uh, can make that one of the choices that people participate with. That's right. Yeah. People can propose options, we call it. So, yeah, people can propose options and those can be graduated into um, things that are up for voting. Mm -hmm. So I guess what I'd love to hear so, is, can I just jump in, Sam, is I'd like to hear some of the use cases that it's been used for that has been most exciting for you. Hmm. Interesting. Well, um, so we have two organizations. One's the technology company, Othello Decisions, and we also have a nonprofit organization called Othello Democracies. And the nonprofit provides Othello for social change organizations and grassroots organizations that want to engage the public in um, policy development and policy advocacy, kind of generating um, mandates for political action. So we've done a few engagements on that front. Um, for example, um, uh, the Springtide Collective in Nova Scotia used a fellow to engage um, some hundreds of people in developing uh, a package of policy reforms for um, basically voting reform in the province. And so this became um, uh, a proposal essentially that they, a lobbying package that they took forward to government and became the basis of their advocacy efforts. So we've done a number of initiatives kind of in that vein, working with nonprofit organizations um, to develop you know, plans or um, policy proposals um, to affect um, political change. So those are the more Exciting ones, it's kind of why we're doing this whole thing. Um, we have the business, you know, we have to develop a revenue model to fund you know, the ongoing growth of the organization, but the end goal is really to support those you know, public policy interventions. So in, as you as you are as you know, a lot of the work that I'm doing is is similar in many ways, but I'm I'm working more in the place of how do we have conversations that can really bring together um, people's wisdom, knowledge, information in such a way that we can see what we have together, right? So uh, essentially the challenge that I see that's important for us to solve is how do we come together on things, right? And so, one of the pieces that I've been curious is how do you see, or is there a possibility for these kind of real-time generative conversations to add to what Othello is up to and add to uh, the process of policy design? I'm not sure. Um, can, you, can you reframe the question a little bit? Yeah. Yeah. So, so for example, uh, there's a couple of the collaborators that I'm really inspired by. One of them is is uh, Daniel Harris, who has uh, technology that he's being funded for uh, that uh, that is uh, digital rights management software, essentially. And he's working with a cohort of of uh, businesses as an organization. And they, they're going to be creating <clears throat> APIs for apps so that one use case for this would be that if you were to sign up to a bunch of different democracy services like change.org and uh, 350.org and, and Avaz, that uh, as a user, it would be a user 
centric system whereby a user can say, oh, okay, I'm going to query all of these democracy applications for my areas of interest and participate with those uh, petitions or policy, policy asks, right? Um, and then so that they can, they can know what they are, but as a, uh, you could also query the app to find out where the will of the people more broadly is as a movement so that politicians and people from the media can say, okay, actually we've got, you know, one and a half billion people that are deeply concerned about this issue rather than these standalone efforts to show the democratic will of people. So this is one project that is within uh, this, this cohort that has been proposed, um, utilizing the technology that they're already creating. Um, and then there's, there's Art Brock. Uh, Arthur Brock has something that, sorry, I don't know if you missed my, that sometimes the network is a little glitchy. Um, so Art Brock has something that's called uh, the Holochain, which is an alternative to the blockchain. And so it, what that does is it allows uh, each individual person to have their own key for their own data mm -hmm. and creates a sovereign and accountable commons. So this is a, a space more on the bottom end of the aggregation of data and those two things could work together but how so there needs to be qualitative conversations to find out the points of intersectionality between those two pieces but they both have similar values and intent in terms of uh, giving people the power themselves to uh, control their data on the one end in terms of Arthur Brock's holochain uh, and on the other hand, with Daniels to be able to put what it is that you'd like to see happening forward. So these are two collaborators that could help each other. And through the qualitative conversations, they can figure it out. Um, now, perhaps in a design phase, Othello could be used to look at what a bigger map would be. But maybe I'm grasping it things that I don't quite see. <laughs> well, I would have to kind of grok the problem space a little bit more. You know, if, it's, if they're doing it some kind of design process and maybe, you know, creating a framework for collaboration, it might be helpful. Um, it sounds like there's an alignment between them. Um, it may be that, you know, given that it's not a big group, that they just maybe just need to sit down together <laughs> and, and kind of hash it out in a brainstorming session. That was really for larger groups, you know, um, it really, it's, it's value proposition becomes more apparent when you get um, above the number of people you can get in a room, right? Because that's where, you know, decision making becomes really problematic when you get you know, above a dozen people, for example. Um, I'll just, I just want to know, because it did trigger something that you said, um, that we are, we are going to be publishing API to the Othello technology. We've been working on it last four or five months, and it's, and we're ready uh, next week. So this will allow third-party developers to um, build their own applications on top of the technology and um, um, allow it to be available for different types of applications. So um, I'm hoping that we're going to you know, make that public and hope other people are going to be interested in integrating kind of this decision-making technology into whatever they happen to be working on. So in, that's awesome. And in terms of Daniel, um, bas basically the example that I gave was one use case of what it can be to connect APIs. Uh, and I think that your API would be really exciting to see connected with others mm -hmm. to see the extensibility of, of how that can, that, that can kind of connect different projects. So I'm curious to to consider into that space. Hmm. Um, Sam, did you have did you have some questions? Hmm. I got a lot of questions, but I want to make sure your flow is uh, it's more or less contained and compartmented, and then we can sort of shift gears a little bit. I pass the baton. 
Okay, so let me riff a little bit first on Tammy's um, question around use cases. You know, so you mentioned policy change. I was just wondering, could you get us a sense of the different areas of the domain, the different kinds of, of large scale decision making, you know, going from design of, you know, spaces on one end to policy description and what else is in that spectrum? Just real quick. Okay, sure. Before yeah. I move on. And I should have, uh, um, I should have shared our application catalog with you before the meeting. We have a, a catalog that details about you know, more than 40 different um, decision types where a fellow has been used. Um, and I'll share it with you, you know. Cool. Um, in a moment. Well, then don't need to repeat that if it's already there then. Uh, I'll, I'll just head, I'll give you the headings. So property development, um, business operations, um, program and product design, employee engagement, uh, community engagement and policy and governance. So those are the major, major heads. And under each one of those heads, there's you know six or seven more specific decision types. So mm -hmm. um, I will. Um, see if I can do this here. No, it's not going to let me drop it into Zoom. Okay, okay. <laughs> but I'll I'll send I'll share a, lo a link with you in in just a moment. Okay. Wonderful. So let me um, follow up on some of that then because. Uh, again, real quick, just to get a spectrum of understanding of this, what's been the, you say it's great, it's useful for greater than a dozen, but what's the low end where it's been applied usefully and what's the high end of decision makers where it's been applied usefully? What's that range like? Uh, the low end is about eight and, um, and it's, it's, you know, so it's been used for um, granting decisions. So Van City had a, a team of um, eight to ten judges. It's used it for three years in a row now for its um, Enviro Fund visa um, um, granting program. So it gives away a few hundred thousand dollars every year, and they've been using Othello for um, evaluating applicants, applying criteria, deciding how to spend however much money they had that year, two hundred thousand or four hundred thousand. So that's been it's been used for that on the low end. It's also been used by the federal government um, with its um, um, real estate experts to do a risk analysis and um, purchase evaluations for large properties. So kind of a real estate development type of decision, but again with experts. So I think eight to 10 is the number there. And on the large side, a couple of thousand. Um, we've done work with the um, Capital Regional District. They um, used a fellow for um, identifying locations and technology for a waste treatment plant. Mm -hmm. um, and um, you know, um, Lead now used a fellow in a kind of a across Canada consultation process around policies for um, blast policy strategies or that they would that Canadians would like to see as part of the election debate during the last federal election. Mm -hmm. um, so you know, from eight to ten up to a couple thousand, okay, and, and in between. You know, All right. Kind of so especially in the eight to ten range, is there a number you can set? below which you don't actually make the, the options visible until let's say the number of votes has reached beyond a certain end. Because to me, it seems like the early votes or early input might influence the later voters, you know, if you have some of this uh, visibility. So, you mean, um, do you mean the results not visible? Yeah, so let's say I come into your example was, that was on the video and say, okay, I rank lead uh, compliance to be 10 out of 10, but I rank, uh, Skur acreage, you know, to be like three out of 10. And, you know, Tammy comes along and says, wow, Sam thinks this, hmm, maybe he's got something there. Or, um, wow, well, uh, you can't see how she ranked it because um, that's not visible. Uh, so people's scores on options is not visible. Only um, the actual concluding design itself? Yeah, and okay. we can hide the results page. It's actually just a button on, yeah. the, on the admin panel that prevents the results page from being visible until some stage so you can you know, make it invisible the whole way through or trigger it at a certain point. And has anyone in all your 40 different uh, case studies ever questioned what the engine, the algorithm was actually doing, or do they just accept that you've got a model that just works? Well, sometimes people works. ask how it works for sure. Um, yeah. and, um, and then we explain it. Um, I think it happens less than you might imagine because um, there's, we provide a, a visualization that makes what's happening kind of easy to understand. It's this um, 
distribution of support, how many people are opposed, how many people are neutral, et cetera. Yeah. And that is really what the engine is doing. It's just evaluating all these different scenarios and looking at what is the profile of support for each one. Mm -hmm. And so um, that seems to uh, clarify things for most people. Um, but we do get questions and you know, we have some materials and you know, answer the questions when, when we have them. Um, by the way, I just posted a link for um, that um, catalog. So um, I'm happy to pause if you want to take a pause and take a look at it, but and we can also keep rolling on. Well, let me, let me ask a follow-up question then, and that is at a very crude, very lay, and possibly something, I hope it doesn't offend you, okay? I'm just wondering, is there a way for me to understand it by just saying it's basically a nested, uh, weighted sum kind of uh, algorithm? Uh, is that what's happening here, or is there more to it other than that? Weighted sum, correct. Nested, not so much. Um, so it's basically, if, are we going to get technical here? Yes. For 15 seconds off of that. <laughs> well, you, you provide a set of options, mm -hmm. and you group those options into issues. right? And then it looks at all the combinations of all the different options. And there can be you know, tens of thousands of combinations. It's a power problem. So the number of combinations will be 2 to the power of n. It builds out all the scenarios that um, scenarios, and then people can. Um, it allows people to indicate their level of support for each one of those different scenarios by a voting on the options and b weighing the importance of issues. And yeah. By doing that, each person creates a function that allows um, the ethyl algorithm to understand how much they would support every single possible scenario. Mm -hmm. So it does that across the group. It gets a function representing each person's preferences, and then it goes and analyzes every scenario looking at the distribution of support for each one. Mm -hmm. And it does that analysis by looking at what is the average level of support for this scenario, and then how polarizing or unifying is this scenario. And it's it definitely, division, right? yeah. yeah, the division, the, the standard deviation. Right. So it looks at the standard deviation of each scenario, and it tries to find outcomes where the average level of support is high and where, um, the standard deviation is low, where people are similar in their levels of support, where you right. don't have winners and losers. And that's kind of one of the curses of majority vote systems, where you put some competing options in front of people, and um, whichever one wins, you're always going to have some losers, because, um, because the nature of the choice selection always surfaces outcomes where some people love it and some people hate it. And so you always get right. some people loving the outcome and some people hating it. Okay. So Tim, I got one more as probably the clincher, but do you want to jump in first before I ask that one? You go. Okay, so if we take a look at what we're trying to do in the GCC team, okay, we're trying to bring in, let's say, the n plus one person, okay, who's probably spent many years working on very cool ideas, while the initial first n people have already shared a number of really cool ideas that are trying to create a model that works. And here comes the n plus one person, who's gonna say, ah, oh, but you didn't consider this, you didn't consider that. So there's like another bifurcation of choices there at that point. So if we're trying to scale to, let's say, 100 people, and each person bringing in, here's what I think governance model ought to include. Here's what the decision criteria ought to include. Here's what you know values I'd like to have represented in the system, whatever they were bringing in. If we do this 100 times for the first 100 people, okay, do you see that a fellow in its current state or maybe in a future roadmap state might be used by a group like this to actually hold these decisions and scenarios and be able to weight them? Or is that not in the sweet spot of what you're building this for? Yeah, it's a good question. So um, as you know, a fellow um, is, um, people participate in the fellow once it's already configured, right? The configuration itself is not crowdsourced. Configuration itself is usually driven by, well, our customers <laughs> who are decision makers. And so they're mm -hmm. paying the bill. We have a business model. Mm -hmm. But we have definitely thought about how we could crowdsource the configuration process itself, right? And so, you know, having a very, you know, generative grassroots type of um, um, process that actually develops the configuration and then proceeds to make the decision. Um, it's the harder part of the problem that, you know, doing the configuration using a crowdsourced 
um, process, and it's also the part of the problem that doesn't pay you anything. So we're delaying it for now. <laughs> but um, in the long-term roadmap, it's definitely, I think, the one that's going to be key to making it a global democracy tool because, you know, people just don't always, don't always want to um, fit in someone else's frame of the problem. They want to participate in the framing of the problem too. And, um, but, you know, that's in, in the vision of the technology and it certainly um, is consistent with the technology too. So in terms of kind of hacking that uh, from where you are now, uh, as options might surface within the parameters of a problem, uh, might you be able to trigger an email or a something to the participants that haven't had an opportunity to vote on that option so that there can be some, some participation after well, the fact? Well, it does that now. Yeah. Okay. I mean, whenever you register, you register with your email and you'll get alerts um, if a new option is added, if someone makes a comment in re response to your comment, and you can configure your um, personal pro preferences so that you get notifications on different um, you know, triggers. So it does that now. Cool, well, that seems like a good hack that can kind of work, uh, work in our favor in terms of if, you know, if there was a potential for us to, to hack around in Othello. Yeah, yeah, yeah. totally. And what would that look like? Do you want me to give you guys a tour of the back end? Yeah, let's do it. <laughs> uh, yeah, so you can just share screen. Yeah, I will. Let's see something here. And so thank I'm going to. Oh, yeah, my pleasure. My pleasure. Um, so I'm going to show you um, the back end, the, the event panel as applied to the community center design problem. Um, you know, in that link you saw, in that catalog you saw, there's many different types of problems that can apply to, and I could show you the back end applied to each one of them, but this is what it will look like in any one of the cases, okay? So it's kind of a WordPress style. Down the left column, you see all the key configuration pages, and in the center area is kind of where we do the work. So I'm gonna walk down the left side, and we'll kind of touch all the different pieces. So the first page is basic setup. You can decide the, the title of your decision. You can decide a URL. Um, you can set up a logo. You can configure how that's displayed. We have English and French um, language ability right now. But it's easy to use other languages. We have a, a built-in uh, thesaurus, so you can do translations fairly easily. Um, Calment, privacy settings, open and close dates. You can style it with different colors determine the font. Um, we also have a custom dictionary, so you can go through and change terms if you want. You know, some people want to use different terms, they want to use issue, they want to use topic. They, you know, there's lots of different things that people might want to customize, so we've you know, accommodated that, the basic setup. And then um, we have this thing, which is the structure of the consultation, so we have a background page that's turned on. We've got a survey turned on. Um, we're not using categories in this instance, um, which are kind of meta groups of issues. We have a lot of issues. We've got six different topics or issues. We have on the right-hand side here, we've got top choices turned on. So each person is identifying their top choice. Um, we could have commenting on the page as well. And then we are also allowing users to make their own proposals. So, um, and then a little bit further down, we're letting people weigh the importance of issues, and then we can configure the text of you know, the comment boxes as well. Okay. So, so that's the pages. And then um, we just go through now, and these are, what you'll see now is the different pages that people will see. So this is how we would configure um, the landing page or the background page. You know, it's basically just an HTML editable box. Yeah. People, you just can type into it, upload images, insert videos, um, you know, can edit the raw HTML if you want. Pretty, it's quite configurable. And there's a, on the, on the right-hand column of the user interface, there's also a, a how is my input used explanation box. So you can go in and customize that as well. Again, pretty easy to do. You can add a survey um, to the process. And so as people, before people go in, or maybe even when they're done, they can answer some questions about themselves or whatever you want. 
Um, we can use this information later to um, group people and do a bit more complex demographic analysis. Okay. We can even aim a fellow at subgroups. So how does, how, how, what's the top decision for people of this group or people of that group? So it allows a bit more granular analysis mm -hmm. of the results. Yeah. Um, um, I think, I don't think I have this page turned on, but this allows us to um, create some tiles that people can click on very easily to navigate through the project. Um, and now I see a couple questions. Should I pause and just address these questions? Sure, yes. Okay, let's see there. Oops. Actually, I was just typing notes, so. Oh, okay, all right, I'll leave it then. Okay. Um, so here is where the meat of it occurs. This is one of the topic pages, and this is where people vote. So you can set the title of the page. So we have a construction and design page for the title. You can determine a description for that page. You can set some constraints. So constraints are a very important part of Othello. It helps turn a, a undifferentiated mass of many, many scenarios into something that really represents a solution set. So for example, here, we've got a constraint that says all outcomes must contain exactly one option from this topic. In other words, we're just gonna choose one construction and design. Any decision that results can only contain one design approach. I'm not gonna have two. So it would be illogical otherwise. So we've got that setting, but I could click it and we could say a minimum or a maximum between and, and change what that says here. We could have, we're gonna contain, we're gonna have two construction design styles or whatever. So that's a, a constraint setting. And then we go in and we can see what the options are. So options are the things that people vote on. And they can vote on a scale from completely opposed to neutral to completely support. And I should say, and I hope the viewer who was watching this has had a chance to watch um, the walkthrough of the Community Center demo, the 12 minute one, because that will add a lot of light <laughs> to what you're seeing here because yes. that's really what the participants experience. So he, we have the standard construction is one of the options that people can vote on. We can change the title just by clicking on it. We can change the description, again, just by clicking on the area. And then we can see some of the variables. So each option can be associated with a bunch of variables that describe it in more depth. In this case, a standard construction style has a cost per square foot, a $350 a square foot, and an operating cost of $1.50 a square foot. And we can invent new variables on the fly, you know, and add as many as we want. And so we can have really a lot of descriptors attached to different options. Um, and as we go on, you'll see that I'm gonna be using all these different variables attached to different options, and that will help us model the economics of the building. Yes. Yeah. So we have uh, standard construction is one option. We have lead gold is another option. Slightly different set of variables associated with this option. And then lead platinum is another option. Again, some other variables. We can go in and um, create some Boolean constraints. So this is another type of constraint, an XOR constraint. If we're gonna have a lead platinum building, maybe it's impossible to have, I don't know, well, a covered area. Maybe something about lead platinum buildings doesn't allow you to have covered areas, whatever reason. So we can set um, these kind of um, exclusionary relationships and that will make, and the engine, the fill engine will make sure that any scenarios that are generated don't contain these um, logical contradictions. So we can identify logical contradictions. Those, that's one of the things that I'm most excited about with this actually, is that oh. uh, just in terms of not just the, if this happens, then this can't, but rather, but also just the general constraint at the outset. It must fall within these parameters oh, yeah. um, just to make it really meaningful. Yeah, and uh, I'll show you uh, a bit more about that. You know, so I have showed you set-based constraints. You know, we're only gonna choose one construction style from this set of construction styles. I've shown you logical constraints. You can have this and that in the same decision. And then in a few moments, I'm gonna show you um, kind of calculated constraints, which are uh, even more, um, I think, interesting in a way. So each one of these, you see we have one, two, three, four, five, six different topic pages. They all follow this general form, a title, and then a set of options with descriptions and variables. Um, 
we can turn on other things. We can allow people to have advisors, mm. um, which means that they can share their vote. And then other people can look at their vote and say, oh, do I, do I agree with this person? So um, it's good um, for purposes where you really want to be transparent or at least allow people to be transparent about how they're voting. Um, and so, it kind of, it gives you that bit of kind of liquid democracy in a sense. Yeah. And you know, um, so the fellow algorithm, well, maybe I'll talk a little bit about this in a minute, but you can go quite deep into the liquid democracy um, philosophy. Um, well, I'll just say it right now, and this is kind of a segue. But with, with this version of the talent, you see people voting on issues, voting on options, and developing their, their influent function, the talk we call it, the influent function, um, um, using those tools. And the influent function is what we use to evaluate all the scenarios. But we can also allow people to create influent functions um, by snipping and um, putting together influence functions of other people. So, oh, well, in terms of construction and design, I don't really have a strong opinion myself, but I know Sam really knows his stuff and Dan knows his stuff, so I'm going to give 20% of my influence to Sam on that, 50% to Dan, Tom is going to get another 15%, and I'm going to vote based on not what I think, but who I trust and how much I trust them. And then I can do the same for other issues or even other criteria. So um, it's really a tool for people to develop um, a, uh, a function that can be used to evaluate a huge set of scenarios and do it in a very easy way. This version here, um, people do it directly by voting on the options and weighing issues, but people can also do it socially by um, indicating how much they trust different people over different issues, to what extent, and over different criteria to what extent. Awesome. And that was a segue. Thank yeah. so you. That, yeah, yeah, my pleasure. And, and I think that um, takes liquid democracy almost to another level. So I'm not just delegating my vote to a single person, but I'm delegating um, my vote on a certain issue to a group of people who may have different levels of trust, or, 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 or even over different criteria. So you get very, very granular with a fellow on kind of the liquid democracy philosophy. Awesome. Um, so each one of the pages here um, has a different topic. Topics contain options. Um, they're all relatively the same, so I won't spend a lot of time looking at that, but I will take you to the outcomes page because this is where um, it's more interesting, I think. So we have a bunch of things here. Um, it, calc it calculates the results on a schedule. It can be once a day or once an hour. Um, and in the new version of the FL of the engine, which is coming out, um, you can set it down to once a minute. You know, it's going to be a much faster one. Um, and then we, here you get in the nitty gritty. And Sam, you might like this. So, so here we can create new variables using the variables that we've already defined. So I've defined a total square foot variable, which is based on the total square footage of all of the options in a scenario, plus 7,000 square feet for a parking lot. So this is the total footprint of a building. Um, for every single scenario, we can use this formula. Then we can also define the construction cost, which is going to be the total square footage times the cost per square foot plus the cost adjustment variable, which is also defined in different places. We can talk about housing revenue. We can talk about the total budget. We can define all these different variables and create new variables. And we can go in and even adjust them using this little calculator. And I have all the variables in front of me, and I can define new formulas. So we have this kind of formula builder, which I can use to create new variables. So I can create a brand new set of kind of second um, level variables. And then what I can do is define boundary conditions. So here are the boundary conditions. I've got a net operating cost as a maximum of 50,000. And I can define the option group to which that applies. And I can set maybe it's exactly or minimum between and change that number too. So what this does is it tells the fellow algorithm if a scenario does not obey these rules, kick it out. And so it enables a fellow to prune out any other scenarios that don't meet the constraints. So now we have three types of constraints. We have logical constraints, we have set-based constraints, and we have these calculated constraints. And it can take this very huge mass of undifferentiated scenarios and prune it down to something very um, specific and, and useful. So, um, 
that is kind of the guts of it, really. I mean, I can go on, and there's lots of other things we could talk about, like reminder systems and authentication and users, and, and I might do that for you, but I'll just stop for a second and, and yeah. ask if you have any questions. Great, perfect. Uh, do we want to um, stop screen share so we can see a little clearer and we can pop back if need be? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, cool. You know, I love complex. I love, I love simple complexity. Hmm. And essentially, that's what you've designed is that seems to me something that's very logical and easy to understand how it works. And yet it's wrestling with so much deep complexity and could build a decision making machine for anything. That's the goal. That's the goal. And I, you know, we're a third of the way there, a quarter of the way there. Um, but... Yeah, what, get, I'm, I'm going to jump here. What is next for, for Othello and for you? What do you, you're, you've, you're just uh, re, uh, releasing, you've got an API, you know, you're, you're just completing a bunch of new milestones. Um, so let's, can we just have a little tiny retrospective of where you've come from just to get this sense of history and where you are now and where you're going? I know that's a big question, but I'd love to know. Yeah, sure. Um, can you hear me? It's got a little bit staccato there for a second. Yes. Yeah. So as with many of my projects, I found that um, it's always about working within financial constraints. So in order to get to this point, we've had to develop a business model that allows us to attract funding and earn revenue. Um, so, so far, we've, I, I call this a fellow classic, what you're seeing here. It's our first version of the technology. Um, um, it's got a very easy to use um, participant interface. So, you know, you invite someone to, to use it as a participant, pretty easy flow. The admin interface is not really um, something I'm publishing to the public. You know, it's, it's complex, it's not UX optimized. Um, we generally will train people to use it. It doesn't take a long time, but um, there's a certain kind of reframing of problems that's needed for people to use Othello effectively. So the next version of Othello is going to um, be a rebuild of the user, the admin panel. So this thing that you're looking at now needs a rebuild. Um, and that rebuild will include a better user experience and also templates and wizards. So if you know what kind of decision type that you're doing, you'll be able to access a template and it will guide you through the configuration process very simply. Um, another thing that we found is the technology stack that we've used is not as scalable as it needs to be for the size of consultations that we're doing. So um, for the geeks in the audience, we use Rails and Ember, um, not the best um, technologies for high volume traffic. And so the API is a rebuild um, using Elixir, um, which is a much faster and more scalable technology. And our new front end will use um, React, which is also much more um, modular. Um, and I think the long-term um, development trajectory is to make that user, um, that administrator configuration process that you see, um, not only user-friendly, but crowdsourceable. So that when we're setting up a decision, we can invite a whole bunch of people and it, we can just start with an empty tabula rasa and the structure will bubble up, right? From that, um, from that um, group. You interacting with the different tools, but the tools will be able to structure that input in a, in a way so that it can just create a process that people can then use to make decisions. So that's kind of the long term. That's what I'm excited about. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to play in that space, but it feels like it's not that far off from there. Um, well, <laughs> Depends on what far off looks like in terms of time or money. If I had lots of money, it wouldn't take very long, right? Um, yeah. So it, how you know, much would it be? How much would it be to, so for example, we've got, you know, we're hoping that somewhere around a hundred people will sign on to our proposal in the next few weeks. We've got 20 or so. Um, and I haven't really 
been doing the outreach that I uh, had hoped at this point because I've, I've been working on the proposal and making that really strong. Um, but I'm confident actually by the end of the month that we could have 100 people that are like, yes, we should work together, let's try. Um, and that for me is enough We've people. Lost Tammy. What's that? Oh, we had some glitch. We've lost you for a second, but you're back. Hey there. Okay. Uh, so in terms of, of this project, part, I, two million uh, us. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> two million. That's it. That's not that much. That's the price. Okay. That's why I'm here. <laughs> I'm great. I'm, I actually, I'm, I'm in this call from San Francisco because I moved here to raise the next round because I can't raise the kind of money I need, um, in Vancouver. It's just, I felt it was just a little bit out there. Um, I found a little bit edgy for the tastes of, um, you know, investors in, in Canada. So that's what brought me here. So 2 million US, if you know anybody, um, give them a nice big chunk of the company if they want to step up and help us get to the next level. Great. Okay. So in terms of, I, I, I love to think into these spaces because obviously what it is that you're creating has great utility and it has, it's, it's important for us to have democratic processes in place and all of these things, right? So uh, I love to think into who would be helped or whose mandate can be served uh, by helping and by stepping up. Yeah. Um, well, I'm, I'm open to your creative thoughts. You know, I'm, I'm here talking to social impact venture firms. Yeah. So, you know, firms that have money and a mission to achieve some kind of, some, some kind of social impact. Um, so, you know, organizations that are focused on governance, new ways of doing democracy, I think a fellow has something for them. Yeah. Um, I haven't made too many steps into the straight granting space, you know, where they'll just give you the money. Um, um, we've really developed a fellow around a business model and, you know, giving returns to investors. Um, but I'm happy to take donations too. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> So uh, we, I'd love to ask you to have a look at our proposal and to see if you want to sign on. Uh, it's, not a, it's not a big timeline in terms of you getting your own proposal in, but perhaps uh, you know, even you being a part of this one may be a useful thing to consider. Um, and I mean, they, it's, it's five million they give away and they give it away in chunks and I think about a million each or something like that. Um, but it is, obviously worth checking out um, and in terms of the language of the task it's to develop a go governance model that can help us uh, that can help us deal with the greatest risks and challenges to humanity today so I do see what it is that you have created as being a really important uh, uh, plank I you know it's and as articulated in the proposal it's not one solution can't, it's not one ring to rule them all. Uh, in terms of what I truly believe is that there's many, many of us that are doing important work. If we can link our efforts together, not only will we be stronger, uh, but we can demonstrate that kind of togetherness and technologically interoperability that can help us to, you know, do it together. And, so anyway, I invite you to have a look at our at sure. the work that we've done. And our contribution to the effort will not only be the platform generally, but the AP, at least for now, the API. So yeah. if people want to integrate the API into you know, blockchain-based voting, which I think is a natural extension of what we're doing. I talked about these influent functions. Yes. It's really a way of capturing people's um, preferences over a very large scenario set. I feel like the next step working with third parties is going to be um, storing that function in blockchain format um, and that something like that is going to be required for global democracy. So, so there's lots of opportunities for other technologies to hook into Othello and um, or Othello to hook into other technologies and create this large, um, I think of it as a dem um, democracy infrastructure. Right. Yes. I mean, yeah. It's yes. not going to arise by itself, but if we can get it going, then maybe you can get the momentum to take off. Yes, Sam. Well, could I rephrase one particular, perhaps dream endpoint as, let's say, you know, we create 
a, uh, a model which could handle a budget of, let's say, $14 trillion with maybe 200 to 350 million participants all try to figure out, okay, what's good, what's bad, you know, kind of in a line by line item veto fashion, right? Yeah. And say, well, you know, I'd rather this go to schools, or I'd rather this go to a nuclear sub, you know, that sort of discussion. Yeah. And kind of bubble that up, right? Mm -hmm. In a way that allows these options to be created as opposed to some set of five or 10 or 20 people saying, this is the way you think about the problem, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's obviously very limiting, right? So yeah. that division that you're working towards, yeah, and it's interesting. Um, if you check out that catalog, you'll see that there's an example of FL used, used for participatory budgeting. Mm -hmm. So it won't take too much imagination for you to look at that particular example and yep. extend it into, okay, now what if we had, you know, doing a really complicated budget? So, mm -hmm. so yeah, it's, it's definitely, um, definitely consistent with that, mm -hmm. that vision. Mm -hmm. So, go ahead, Sam. Uh, just really simply, I should have read your w website, but... What's the um, usage fees that are required as, you know, say on the low end all the way up to the high end? So for commercial, for commercial customers, and, you know, that includes government and um, enterprises and, you know, nonprofits with money, um, between five and $25,000. So it's a higher end kind of tool. Mm -hmm. But for nonprofits, um, it's free. So the technology is free. And we and you know there's probably be some need for our professional services, but we also charge that at cost. So we make it very easy for um, nonprofit organizations, grassroots organizations that want to affect policy change or um, mobilize communities to use the technology. Um, it's not my main focus right now, so we're not marketing that. Um, I'm just I'm helping people that come in who find out about us, really, and you know people do, so we help them. Um, well, maybe I'll hear more as a result of this conversation, but um, I'm happy to, if you guys like, um, create a, a blank project, give you guys admin privileges and let you start kicking it around. I don't know if you want to, but I'm happy to extend that to you. Wonderful. Thank you. Yeah. That would be fun. Actually, just to understand where this thing could go is really, really cool. So yeah. I, we'd really appreciate that offer. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'll do it after this call. I'll set okay. up a project and you'll get an invite email in your box and, wow. and uh, you can go on and kick around. Just one thing I'll just note, just so you know, um, well, I'll include some instructions in the email. So Awesome. Yeah. Perfect. So it occurs to me uh, as well that I would invite you if I know you don't have a whole lot of spare time, but I would invite you to uh, uh, watch a couple of the podcasts that I've created uh, for some of the other participants uh, and this particular blog that has a couple of them in it is what's kicked off this global challenges collaboration project itself. Um, one will sort of let you know a little bit more about Daniel Harris and his work and what he's up to and the other one is Art Brock and his his project's neat because it's the holochain is as a, uh, a different expression of the blockchain um, and his uh, what he's part of what he's looking to build is a sovereign accountable commons and I can really see how your work can intersect with his and so I I don't mean to give you homework but I'm inspired oh, like to, <laughs> I'm inspired to give you that to have a look at just to see and consider how uh, how these things can intersect sure, well I'm glad. if you could send me that link that'd be, I'd be appreciated yeah, we'll do. Well, thank you. Thank you, both of you, uh, for taking the time today to do the deep dive. Also, John, thank you so much for doing the work and for creating this. I know that uh, creating new projects and, and doing this, this kind of leading edge work is a labor of love and uh, your day is never over. And I really appreciate you taking the time to share it with us. So thank you. Oh, Tammy, you're, you're always so gracious. Thank you very much. My pleasure. You're welcome. You're welcome. Okay, Sam, anything final from you? No, I think this is good. Are we doing a checkout? Uh, we will, but we'll bring this to a close. So thank okay. you. Okay. Thank you both so much. And until next time. Yeah, thank good. you both for being interested in the fellow. It's our pleasure. <laughs>